we want the economy to move. Clearly, it's not moving. So clearly, we're going to have just we're, we're having economic destruction. OK, um, tr people trying to keep things going. Are, that's a that's a positive. And the companies who are, let's say, essential, semi-essential, whatever else, they are trying as much as they can to mitigate the risks. So I've been to the Home Depot. I don't know if you've ventured out to the Home Depot or not, but I actually went there two weeks ago to get something for my grill so I could grill at home because my grill needed a part. So I went and I, I had to stand in a line. I had my mask on, my gloves, and the line, there were these stickers, you know, you stand on this sticker, right, or tape or whatever it was, you know, they were like eight, 10 feet apart. And then they were only, they were keeping a number track of who was in the store and they only let in a certain number of people in the store mm -hmm. and everybody was far away from each other so i went and i got my part and then i went over to the self-checkout and i put my thing in and then i walked out the door and i was inside the home depot for maybe eight minutes total <laughs>
I do like that one. I think that's funny. I yeah. think Tom likes it too. He's not. No, actually, I had a I had a colleague who uh, was teaching at I want to say it was like Florida State. He's a really good guy. This is uh, maybe. 13, 14 years ago when I was interacting with this guy and he would teach in these big lecture rooms and every day he would throw some image of Chuck Norris on the screen, just, just randomly. And then he would just, and whatever he was, so he was talking about economics. And so he'd be talking about it and Chuck Norris would come up and he'd say, yeah, Chuck Norris is going to destroy that demand curve. And then it would just, then it would just, the lecture would just move on. And so whatever he was talking about monopolies would be like, yeah, Chuck Norris, he is a monopoly. And then boom, it would go. It was every class. And I said, don't your students get tired of it? He said, actually not really. Cause they're wondering where Chuck Norris is going to show yeah, up in today's that's lecture. That's a brilliant teaching strategy. Yeah, it was kind of cool. Yeah. He was a smart dude. When I, when I uh, was, Freshman in college, um, I had a psychology class, 8 a.m. So, so freshman year, 8 a.m. psychology class, big lecture hall. Okay? Uh -huh. And that professor, would, he would do one of two things. He would either come in to try and get us all woken up and kind of get us engaged, either sometime during the lecture or the beginning. He'd either start making weird noises like whoop, whoop, whoop. You know, which would, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> or, now remember, he's got a room full of 18-year-olds. Or yeah. he would just go, sex, 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 sex. Nice. And then, yeah, then he would just go on and keep doing the lecture. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, we don't have to say yes. that on this show. What just happened? You can <laughs> say that on this show. Say a lecture on the show? Yeah. <laughs> no, well, that was right. not the word I was referring to. No. Oh, okay. Whitney didn't like me saying sex. Oh, I see. Okay, <laughs> yeah. all right. Fine. So, um... Positive thing. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do mine last. Tom, how about you? You got a positive thing for you this week? Something you know? Um, so my positive thing is I, I, I re reconnected with my, with my gym and my trainer, and we worked out a couple times via Facebook. I know uh, FaceTime. You know. Yeah. So I just, yeah. so I have like the minimum amount of gym equipment in my house, and so uh, we figured out. I mean, he, we're doing density blocks and you know lots of lifting and um lots of you know crazy burpees and stuff like that i mean just he just destroyed me in in about 40 minutes when it usually takes about an hour and i was like darn dude this is this is good and he's like yeah well we can meet every tuesday thursday some fridays you know on uh facetime and just you know we'll work out and i was like that's great because i hadn't been i hadn't worked out for probably you know four weeks hadn't been to the gym at all and he even though he is a gym owner, I, you know, I don't suspect he's going to open. I mean, I don't think he wants to make any of his clients um, exposed or anything. So he wants to make yeah. us all healthy. He wants to make us strong. So he's figuring out how to make things work in this crazy environment. And I, I thought that was really cool. I was like, that's great. I love this guy. I love going to his gym. But if we can do it in the backyard, terrific. So for me, that's good because I really like to exercise. I like to stay healthy. That's I'm super jealous. I'm the same boat. I've, I have not had a good workout routine for like four to five weeks. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and that becomes part of your life and you need those endorphins. You need, for yeah. me, I go to the gym. It separates my life. It's my work life. It's not even my home life. It's something else. It's really just very, I guess, very ego centric, yeah. right? It's all about me, right? At that, when it's at the gym, it's all about me. It's all about my health. It's all about my goals. And it's okay. It's okay to like segment some of your time and focus that way on yourself. I think that's yeah. really valuable. And so the gym is, you know, it's one of my, one of the places I go to refocus, re-energize. And so I, I love it. My gym routine was very robust before COVID and now it sucks. And so, but, uh, but hopefully we can figure out a way to get it, get it back, get a nice routine going. You need more uh, Chuck Norris in your life. I do. I need more Chuck Norris. That is hundred percent true. So I'll, I'll do mine real quick. I would say the, the thing, it's a small one, but it was a really, it's a good thing. We, one of our restaurants, it's close to our house. It's an Asian bistro. It's Vu Asian bistro. And they cool. reopened for takeout only. Nice. And, and so we placed an order and had like, that was like our big, big meal out this week, you know, nice. we it up and brought it back and sushi. And it was great. Wow. Everybody good. just loved it. And it was nice to have that little special thing and yeah. feeling like good things were happening. You know, there's a restaurant that had been closed for a couple of weeks and, they opened up and we were happy about that and got to support them. So simple. It's great. Sometimes it's good. Little things. 
Mm-hmm. My, now my action item for next week is I got to get that gym routine going. Like I got to, I got to figure out a way to exercise and work out without yeah, I, going to the gym. Yeah. It depends on if you've got a big gym or this is just a little boutique little gym, you know? And so he's, you know, yeah. he's making it work. I don't know. I'll send, I'll send you the guy's information. You want to reach out to the guy. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, well, so I want to now talk about the economy. Okay. Something just, that's pretty simple and easy Random. to deal with. Yeah. Like it's, it's more basic conversation today. Yeah. So, Tom, um, just so people who don't know you, give kind of a quick snapshot on kind of who you are. Who is this guy with the really cool headphones that they're seeing? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm Tom Smith, Thomas Moore Smith, named after a Catholic saint um, from the Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago. Um, I spent starting in first grade, moved out to the suburbs, a little farming community outside of the city, about 45 miles, 40 miles north, northwest of the city. So I grew up just outside of Chicago, but really I, I've never spent more than uh, a minute, more than maybe 250 miles from Chicago. So I went to uh, undergrad in Illinois, went to grad school at university of Illinois in Chicago. I, um, and then I was teaching at different schools in Chicago. I taught for a while at Loyola, taught for a while at um, North central college. Uh, I, I taught at, um, University of Illinois at Chicago for years. And so then I was recruited in 2007 and come down, came down to Emory in 2008. And so I've been here for 12 years and I teach in every program at the business school. So from pre undergrad, like pre BBAs to BBA programs to, I teach at least one class. I have some con- contact with every single program in the, uh, in the school, um, I don't teach PhD students, and, but I might touch on MPA students at some point. I'm not sure. But uh, MBAs, evening MBAs, executive MBAs, weekend MBAs, modulars or split format MBAs. So I, I'm all over the place. And then I do probably uh, 100 media events a year, although this year will be much larger than that because I've done probably 35 to 50 in just the last uh, four weeks. I do about two a day. And that's because your expertise is in? Labor economics, the general macroeconomics. Yeah, I think you want to talk about me instead of like, what do I know, right? Oh, two different both. things. Yeah. So people want to know, it, like, who's this guy? Yeah. Why, so, why yeah. I so, I, I mean, I have a PhD in economics. I study, I've studied labor economics and economics of the arts, economics of philanthropy, economics of religion. But I talk a great deal about macroeconomics, macroeconomic trends, policies, fiscal policies, monetary policies as they relate to sort of everyday life. And so I try to stay away from very technical jargon when I'm discussing economics and try to make it very conversational and digestible for, let's say, the average Joe and Jane on Main Street. So okay. that's, my, that's my vibe. And so I, that's what I'm good at. Excellent. So let's let's do a little uh, economics. Okay. So, so so tell me a little bit about when you think about at least. Well, you can break it any way you like. Just yeah. U.S. economy or yep. slash global economy, any way you want to take it. But what do you see? What are you seeing right now? And what should we be paying attention to? Yeah. So I mean, I'm sure you guys are hearing, um, and your listeners or watchers are hearing that every Thursday the the weekly unemployment initial unemployment claims are coming on for the previous week. So in the last five weeks, we've had something about 27 to 28 million people who have uh, filed for unemployment claims. Mm -hmm. To put that in perspective, in 2001, there were 2.1 million people who were unemployed during 2001. That was an economic recession. That was, and, and unemployment went up um, as a result of that. And that was dot com bubble and 9 11 terrorist strikes and, and Enron and what have you. So this is uh, more than 10 times what we saw in 2001. 2001 was a mild recession. So this is, un, we're in unprecedented territory. If you look at just what's going on here, Georgia. They've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are who are filing initial unemployment claims. And in any week, the, the Georgia is processing more unemployment claims than they have in years. 
so this is, we're in really, really unprecedented territory. So the unemployment rate going into February was about 3.5%. Uh, came back that because of half of March, March's unemployment rate went up to 4.5%, but that doesn't really capture what's going on. I would anticipate that somewhere between three and five of every 10 workers is really unemployed or furloughed. So the unemployment rate is probably somewhere between 30, 35% and 50%, which is insane. During our last economic recession, 2008, the unemployment rate topped at just over 10%. Georgia's unemployment rate during that time was running about a full point above the national levels, but that's because we were very, very exposed in the housing mm. sector. We have lots of let's say, uh, vendors, people who uh, service housing, North Georgia, all this, all this flooring, all of these roofing wraps and roofing tiles and things of this nature. So Georgia was very, very exposed during the 2008 recession. So um, we were running a full point in unemployment above the nation. But it's going to be much, much, much worse than that. So 50% uh, unemployment, completely that's, unprecedented. That's, I had no idea it was that high. So help, uh, help me understand where, where does furlough fit in that? Is that part of that number or is that or yep. is that a different thing? No, I mean, furlough is people are borrowing this this term. It's a, really a government term. So uh, at various times, different governments have had to furlough their workers, but they usually furlough their workers for short periods of time. So we've had a couple, uh, let's say, government shutdowns in the last 20 years, right? A little bit one during Obama, a small one during President Trump. So the government shutdown is they furlough all, let's say, non-essential workers. But, but So furloughing means that you retain your relationship with the employer. So the employee-employee still have a relationship. You yeah. just either don't have work for them or you don't pay them for that day. So you say, okay, you're going to furlough on Friday. So my buddy who worked in Chicago for years, every once in a while, Chicago would say, well, because of budget, we're going to have a furlough Friday. So you just don't come in. Of course, I mean, you have to answer emails, and I mean, they're probably working anyway, but you just don't come in. You don't get paid for the day, but on Monday, you still have a job. So uh, companies that are furloughing their workers are retaining the worker's relationship. So if they do reopen, they don't have to go out and rehire everybody, redo paperwork, get everybody back on board and onboarding and what have you. They can just say, okay, business is open back up. Boom, you're ready to go. You're already in the payrolls and what have you. Um, once upon a time, when it was just government, typically government employees who were furloughed weren't counted in unemployment because maybe it's a day, maybe it's two days, right? Because the government doesn't have enough money. But now people are being furloughed for a month. So they're counted in the unemployment ranks. But we don't really know and probably don't have visibility into what that breakdown is, right? We don't know of that 35 to 50% you mentioned, we don't know what percentage is furlough versus folks that have been laid Full off separation. Yeah. It, yeah. And at some point it doesn't really matter because these are all people who are still not working. So if your company says we're going to furlough you, let's keep our relationship and let's get our fingers crossed. Um, if they either didn't get um, payroll protection plan money, if they didn't get an SBA loan, if they don't have any kind of real prospects of opening at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if they're furloughed okay. because they still don't have a job, right? I mean, okay. they have a job, but the company's not working. So it's the same as being unemployed. You're not getting a paycheck. Yeah. All right. So let's, I'm going to talk to you about in a minute about what your things you might be either concerned about as we go forward. But before we sure. talk about that, let's talk about positive because I want to make sure we at least capture something positive. What do you see here in the way that we're handling this or the way the economy's moving, are there any positive things that you would look at that say, you know, that's, that's, I'm hopeful there, or I'm optimistic here? Well, I'd say individual business owners are resourceful up to a point, right? So if you stick on the positive, I would say that just like my like my the gym gym owner that I go to, I mean, he's trying to figure out a way to keep his business working. So if it means doing FaceTime workouts or sending me videos or what have you, then that's uh, being resourceful. And he's, I mean, he's trying to keep his business together, and I I respect that. I'm seeing lots of people trying to figure out how to continue their business in an environment that is incredibly difficult to operate. 
I don't think any of us really realized how difficult it is to operate and say it in a home office where time and pressure are just all on top of us. And for a lot of people, now they're homeschooling their kids. They've yeah. got childcare duties, just this sort of unending amount of pressure. And I'm still seeing people get their job done, trying to make a go at it. That's, that is um, uplifting to see people who are making all of these um, Herculean efforts to try to get things done in, in this economy. It's really, really challenging. And so, yeah, that gives me hope, but it's, but that's a, just a share of the companies that are doing that. So it's like for every 10 companies, maybe only four can say we can actually do business this way. It's hard to do business like virtual business. If you're a company that actually delivers a tangible product to a consumer, right? I mean, how can you virtually deliver a tangible product? You can't, you have to, actually deliver the product. So it's as much as I've seen, you know, companies trying to be resourceful, there's a lot of other companies are saying, we've got just, there's just no hope for us. I mean, we can't do anything. Yeah. So, okay. So we've got initiative, creativity, entrepreneurial yep. spirit, nimbleness, flexibility. Yeah. There's, there's some of that, which is, which is good. And, and, um, and maybe out of this comes some innovations, which we keep going forward, which helps kind of create new opportunities for businesses. So what yeah. are uh, what are what are things that you are um, watching real close that maybe concern you or worry you? Well, I am a little. I mean, I'm concerned about sort of opening things back up. Um, I'm tr trying to listen to as many health experts as possible, trying to get a sense for how these things um, how these things flow. Like, what's the ebb and flow of of infection rates and things like this? And, and I'm not a physician. And so, I mean, luckily I teach a bunch of them and they're very, very smart people and they're explaining what's, what is likely to happen, but you open to up too early and, um, yeah, people can be asymptomatic and, the, and they can also not even show if, even if they catch this thing, if they're going to be symptomatic, they might not show symptoms for 14 days. So let's suppose we open up today. We're supposed to open up, you know, a bunch of things, beauty salons, right. And barber shops and gyms. And so let's suppose that people get exposed as a result of this. We wouldn't know, we wouldn't see a spike for maybe the next 14, 15, 16 days. So we're trying this experiment in the next two weeks. You say, yeah, this experiment works great. And then all of a sudden, boom, you have an explosion of cases and you say, oh, the experiment didn't work. Well, by then you've just got a bunch of more people who are exposed and, you know, potentially in deadly situations. That's, that is very concerning. I'm, I can feel for business owners that, want to open up, but I certainly don't want anybody to open up at the cost of their lives. I mean, that's, that's tragic. So that's, I'm paying a lot of attention to that. I don't know if that's exactly what you were asking about, but I mean, I'm really concerned about opening up too early yeah. because it's, you know, we have to get control of this. So here's something I want to take the other side of the coin on that. Um, not, not that I agree with you completely, by the way, is there such a thing as opening too late? So, you know, I, I, from my perspective, I see some businesses have a certain amount of cash flow. They can weather a storm for a while. Yep. And, and kind of the analogy, it's like, you know, they, they can idle the engine. But, right. if you keep, but if you keep it idled or turned off too long, it won't, you know, wait four months and have a restaurant trying to reopen. They may not be able to reopen. No, so I, can, there, I can. Yeah, I can appreciate there, from, that. From your, from your perspective, is do you say like, yeah, this would be too late if we go do if we keep everybody sheltered in place for six months, for example. I, I mean, I don't oh, know what the number is, but I mean, yeah, what's, it, what is what's what's like what's I, too long? I don't that. So that's a tough one. I mean, it's some people would say like a month is too long. I mean, it, so here's one of the here's something that we've got to think about. And I'm, I'm going to move this conversation just a little bit to the left or right, if you will, not politically, just just a little bit sure. off yeah. is that um, is that. We want the economy to move. Clearly, it's not moving. So clearly, we're going to have just we're, we're having economic destruction. OK, um, tr people trying to keep things going. Are, that's a that's a positive. And the companies who are, let's say, essential, semi-essential, whatever else, they are trying as much as they can to mitigate the risks. So I've been to the Home Depot. I don't know if you've ventured out to the Home Depot or not, but I actually went there two weeks ago to get something for my grill so I could grill at home because my grill needed a part. So uh, I went and I, I had to stand in a line. I had my mask on, my gloves, and the line, there were these 
stickers, you know, you stand on this sticker, right, or tape or whatever it was, you know, they were like eight, 10 feet apart. And then they were only, they were keeping a number track of who was in the store and they only let in a certain number of people in the store mm-hmm. and everybody was far away from each other. So I went and I got my part and then I went over to the self checkout and I put my thing in and then I walked out the door and I was inside the Home Depot for maybe eight minutes total. Well, there's a business that's trying to keep things together, right? I mean, they're, they're not going to be too late. Like they're open. They're open for business and people know it and they're queuing up outside. So you might have to wait for 30 minutes before you get in, but you get in, you get your stuff, you get out. No more kind of laissez-faire shopping, if you will. Very, very pointed, which is fine. Um, if businesses that can do that, I think you can open up these businesses and people would have to understand how that works, but they could open up. So, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's just, the right time to do that now that everybody is masked up gloved up but it should be very purposeful so it's like okay i need to go to steinmart or macy's or something fine there's only 50 people in that store we got someone at one entrance you're not even allowed in this entrance you got to go to this entrance we're tracking everybody what do you need i need a new belt okay wait Boom. Okay, here's your time. Go in, get your belt. Go in, get your belt. Get out. I mean, it's not, it's not exactly fun shopping, but it's maybe it helps Macy's, maybe it helps you. I mean, those kind of businesses, if done correctly with the right amount of mitigation and all of the virus issues, you could probably open business. So you said the restaurant down the street from your house, they opened up, and but it's takeout only. Um, you know, I mean, if you can do that and it's safe, then it's great. I just read an article about three minutes before coming online that said the risk of actually getting the virus through either a food container or a takeout food container is really, 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 really low. So it's, it's the virus. There's not enough of the virus that's sticking to like cardboard and what have you so that you'll be susceptible. And they said they haven't found anybody who's actually contracted the virus through, let's say, food itself. So this seems to be a pretty safe way of going about uh, getting your meals. And so it makes a lot of sense. If these companies can open up that way, then they probably should. I, I don't think I completely answered your question. Well, I, but. Here's what I heard in that. I heard you say, rather than thinking about it in terms of like I was an oversimplistic way of, you know, everything turns on at a certain point, the, the rolling openings, which is what's being proposed. And, and you put a particular angle on the, the businesses that can do rolling, that, that can open, that can control the flow and experience better. So, you know, you're the only one in a store, you're, you're buying a product, right? So it's more, more purchasing a product. I think where we run into trickier situations is when it's an experience, right? Oh, hundred percent. You know, yeah, that's restaurants, you know, maybe hotels to a certain degree, barbershops, beauty salons. Some of those are experiences, a little more hands-on touch. You can't maintain the distancing. It becomes a little, a little trickier. Yeah. David Buster's is not going to work in this environment. Dave and Buster's, right? I mean, I mean, my kids love Dave and Buster's, right? So you, I mean, but it's there's just no way that Dave and Buster's works in this scenario because I mean, people have got their hands all over all these machines and whatever else, right? Yeah. So I want to, um, I want to take some questions in a minute. I have one last question for you, and then I want to, then I'm going to turn it to Whitney to see what kind of questions she might have or we've seen on uh, Facebook Live. Okay. My last question is, what can we expect for the end of 2020 and 2021? So if you look in your magic economist crystal ball crystal ball you know which is a pretty cool crystal ball it is what what do you see in q4 2020 and first quarter 2021 both from an economy standpoint but also as individuals i mean what 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 should we expect well from from our economics and if we don't get the if we don't get a really good understanding of how to control the virus how to control the spread which we have already have some ideas but we don't know how to stop it then I could see this kind of self-quarantining, mulling around, going all the way through summer and into the fall, and then people being bracing for a second wave that could be very, very deadly. And so I've read a bunch of articles about Wuhan and Hebei and second waves coming. Um, That would be scary. And if that's the case, then we're looking at, you know, what I'm calling COVID depression, right? Just prolonged economic awfulness for maybe the next nine months, right? Maybe all the way until next spring. Like maybe a year from now, we'll be like, wow, that was awful. Like, let's, let's get things going again. Um, that, that's a worst case scenario. Best case scenario would be 
getting a handle on things and having things starting to roll out a little bit in um, maybe late fall or, or, you know, end of end of fall, beginning of, let's say, November, something like that. That's probably best case scenario. In either of those scenarios, I think that the way the consumers are going to be spending and the kinds of goods that are going to be offered are going to be completely different than what we saw before. So, you know, after after 9-11, after 2001, uh, we, you know, we, the way we travel was changed 100%. Some goods that were being offered just weren't offered anymore. I mean, nobody thought, you know, going through body scanners was going to be um, – it was going to be the way of business, but you know, I mean, 19 years later, like, yeah, this is what we do. We have to buy our water on the other side, or we have to bring a water bottle through, or you know. And so, there are limitations, and that's what it is. And we live with that. I think we're going to have to live with it in a different kind of a world. And so, I wouldn't be surprised if, when this all gets said and done, that you're heading into, let's say, a grocery store. Let's say a year from now, you're heading into a grocery store, and there is right there. Um, a little box with the rubber gloves, right? And a mask. You just like, oh, grab your mask, grab your gloves before you come in the store. And if somebody sees you without it, they're like, no, no, no. You can't come into my store without mask and gloves, right? And you're just like, okay. And you, you walk in and you're like, okay, I got to put the gloves on. I got to put a mask on to go buy my Lucky Charms. Like I could totally envision that that's the way the business is going to go because people will say, I just that we just can't take chances like this anymore. Now we always always have to be vigilant. Yeah, that's a I think that's a realistic model and some places that that we've grown to love just maybe just not done ever come back. So movie theaters, it might be that movie theaters just never really come back. People say, yeah, I can stream the movie or the or the studios actually end up having release parties right to your house. So they say, OK, the new James Bond movie is going to be you know released this Friday, you know, so at eight o'clock at eight o'clock at 10 o'clock at midnight, at two in the morning. You know, for twenty dollars, you and your friends can sign up, get your own popcorn, get your own blankies, sit down, and boom, there's James Bond for you. And you go, "Wow, I didn't even have to go to the theater right here. This is it. We just watched James Bond in our living room." I anticipate that we're going to see products that look just like that. Our industry is going to maneuver to make us safer, or you know, uh, keep us um, uh, keep us keep us safe. Yeah. Wow. Uh, okay. So Whitney. Have there been any particular questions on Facebook that we want to throw Tom's way? Yeah, so Stephanie, Kristen, Emily, you're all watching um, a question. What way and is there a way companies and businesses can prepare for the future? So if we have something similar that happens like this down the road, what are some things we can do at this point to prepare for the future? Tom, what do you think? That's to you. Um, well, I'll it would depend on the you. yeah. It would depend on the type of company. I I think that companies after this, if they continue to be diligent, then they will, in some respects, always be prepared for this. So if they say, okay, so here's here is our new set of rules. Our new set of rules are: you don't worry about coming to work if you're sick. If you're sick, you go home. And your paycheck is still there. Now, you're going to get some bad actors. You're going to get people who are like, I don't feel like going into work on Friday, so I'm going to call in sick. But that happens anyway. So, But if companies just say, here's our new policy. Like, you're feeling sick, you don't come in. You don't, yeah, we don't want people to be exposed to whatever it is you have. You have sick relatives, you go home, right? You take care of them. So maybe there's going to be more flexibility with respect to how we treat workers, how we treat workers' illnesses, okay? But it also could be, uh, by the way, like no congregating at the water cooler anymore. Does anybody have a water cooler anymore? I mean, but no congregating at lunch or whatever else. So, uh, boom, this group takes lunch this time. This group takes lunch this time. This group takes lunch this time. And we've got three breakout rooms. You know, those there's, those are the three seats that we have. Or those are the eight seats. You go in, you eat your lunch, you talk to people. But then, you know, you get back to your office, you get back to work. Just total social distancing, a way that people are interacting but not face to face anymore. I could envision that as being the way forward. And so like I would say an ounce of prevention. So everybody starts becoming more diligent about this type of event right, from an individual company's perspective. Yeah. And then I, I could anticipate also that companies would be spending more of their resources to, let's say, try to, if they're being really thoughtful, 
say, look, it's it's great the way that we do these runs and we do these uh, you know fundraisers and whatever else. But now maybe the runs and the fundraisers are all set up for okay, this is all going into sort of like pandemic research, trying to prevent us from being extinct next time. And so yeah. just all efforts are focused on here's who's working in these areas. This is the kind of research that needs to be done. You know, let's give these people, you know, the resources that we need. And, and so, I mean, I'm seeing that happen right now where every chance that I'm, I, we're seeing our students, our MBA students, their funds are going towards the hospitals, their funds are going towards doctors, their class gifts are going towards, you know, people who are on the front line of this. And so I'm already seeing people saying, okay, well, these people need resources then we should just funnel our resources that direction. So I think firms being thoughtful are going to start thinking about, okay, how do I make sure that the people who keep us safe yeah. are taken care of? I, I love that. I think the only thing I would add to it is that to your, to your point in terms of how people work, I think we're going to get much more comfortable with pe people working remotely. And, and we may have more policies in place that will allow people to do it. Like every Friday, you can work from home. Every Monday and Friday, you can work from home. There'll still be times when you need people to come in to have meetings or, or work together, but there's going to be a little more flexibility. Um, the only other thing I would add is I think while Tom spent a lot of time talking about how we work, I think there's also going to be some effort on what kind of work companies and firms do. So I think they're going to think it differently about having a diversified portfolio of products and services. So they're going to, so for example, no one would have thought six months ago that toilet paper was sexy. Now, what company would not like to have a toilet paper like product right now that, that would still be bringing revenue so they wouldn't have to furlough people so they could continue to pay people. So I think you're, I think they're going to look differently on categories of non-essential versus essential and try and find ways to provide goods and services in multiple different scenarios. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's going to, I think it's going to open up how companies think about diversifying their business model so yeah. it can weather different kinds of storms. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. That's a great yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, Whitney, do we have another question? So one question came across and I, I have a follow up to this. Um, Tom, what, what is your recommendation for business leaders out there that are trying to get, information um because there's a lot of information circulating mm. around yeah. and to to this question it, she made the point some things are still positive so how meaning how are we deciphering like a lot of people are viewing the fact that georgia is opening up is that everything's okay a lot of people are, are reading. Is that, is that true? I don't even, I don't know. I mean, I, I was on the radio station with somebody from San Francisco yesterday. So San Francisco radio station called me and they said, uh, how, how are people really reacting to this? And I mean, everything I've seen is that it's a very, very mixed bag. So you've got the governor who says, well, I want to open this thing up. And then you've got um, individual salon owners saying, no, I want to keep my employees safe or I want to keep my, um, my customers safe. So I, I, so it's very, very mixed bag. I don't think, I don't know if there's that many people who are saying, oh, everything must be great. Here's, you know, what I'm also seeing, and maybe this is getting to the root of it in terms of like information that you believe or don't believe. And so one of my colleagues mentioned this long time ago that, that President Trump is constantly engaging in A-B testing. So it's like, okay, I'll throw out this idea and throw out this idea and see which idea sticks. And he'll do A-B testing in the same sentence. So he'll say, I want businesses to open, but it's too soon. But maybe it's not too soon, but it's really, really too soon. We got to be safe. But you know what? Do whatever you want. It's like, wait, what? What policy are you recommending? It's, and I'm only just barely paraphrasing the, what I saw the president say the other night when he was talking about Georgia. And I mean, it made me feel good. He's like, I love the people from Georgia. They're great people. I'm like, oh, thank you. I love that. Thank you very much. And then he was like, I want you to go to work, but it's too soon. But you should do what you think makes sense, but not too soon. It's too soon, I think. But go ahead and open. I'm like, what? There's... So if, if the person who's sending you this question says, I'm getting conflicting pieces of information, then they're absolutely correct. Like in this, in the same sentence, we're hearing the president of the United States say, open, don't open. Great. Terrible. Thank you. 
No, thank you. So I want to I want to build on that question for a minute. So it's hard to get just to state the obvious. It's hard to get news without having a have a very strong political slant. And 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 an yeah, agenda. I wasn't trying to be too political there. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. So, but I think I think one. If I was to riff off that question, Tom, where do you go for information? Like, if you want information, you want to get educated. Yeah. Where do you go where it feels it's the it's the cleanest and it ha doesn't have some kind of a spin or agenda tied to it? Well, when it comes to, to health information, I mean, I'm going to the CDC. Right. And so, yeah. I mean, the CDC, their only their only agenda is to keep people healthy. Right. I mean, it, you may be a conspiracy theorist and think that that's true. But I mean, I truly believe that the CDC is trying to keep people healthy. So if I want health information, I go right to the CDC and they've got lots of lots of information there and lots of resources available. If I'm looking at economic information, I'm going to the Federal Reserve website. I'm going to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I'm going to the Bureau of Economic Analysis. I'm looking at you know, the Fred St. Louis. I'm looking at the data, right? And then I read everything. So you know, I'm reading articles that are on uh, that are on uh, Huff Post, and I'm reading articles on CNN and Financial Times and Wall Street Journal, right? And you might say, well, those are all you know in the same bent. Not really. I mean, Wall Street Journal is a pretty conservative. Um, publication. I mean, their op-ed page is like very, very conservative. And you say, so is there some information you can get from looking at, let's say, something that's maybe much more liberal bent or something that's much more conservative bent? Yeah, like understanding the full spectrum of perspectives and also the full spectrum of information. So like spending 30 minutes reading New York Times, spend 30 minutes reading Wall Street Journal, spend 30 minutes going over stories on CNN, spend 30 minutes going over Market Watch, Reuters, HuffPost, you know, and, you know, spend some time on Fox, like just see what their perspective is. I'm getting full information from everybody so that, uh, so that if I'm asked a question, I can say, okay, well, over here, they're saying this, over here, they're saying this, this is a consensus idea. This is, you know, what Fauci is saying. This is what Han is saying. This is what Gupta is saying. And I mean, by adding in all those perspectives, then you can say, well, so what the big takeaway is this. Yeah, that's what the big takeaway is. So, you know, just be informed, be educated. Uh, don't get all your information from one source. I mean, you might not have time to do it, but I think our lives depend on us being super informed right now. Yeah, that's really great. So Whitney, is there another question? Because I do have a closing question for Tom before we end today. Good. We're, we're good. Okay. So Tom, I'm going to close with this. Um, so for if you think about our our listeners, so it's probably going to be they could be, you know, 45 year old director level. They've got a couple kids. They're working from home, or it could be a small business owner. But if you think about kind of that listener kind of base, it's kind of sitting in the middle like that in terms of life stage and all the moving parts. Yeah. Uh, what piece of advice would you have for us? What is something that we could do today? that would be a good thing, e either from a life perspective, economic perspective, just right. any kind of nugget you've got for us. Well, I mean, only, I mean I'm mean, i an economist, and so I mean, I, I look at the, at the world through an economics lens, if you will. So the perspective I would say would be that we've lived through really terrible recessions, um, and we're, we're going to come out of this, but you have to just change your, let's say, where the goalpost is and just understand that it's going to take diligence and just some incredible sacrifice and perseverance to get out of this. It, so it's, I don't think it's going to serve anybody well to think that there's going to be a light switch in, January, uh, in July and all of a sudden the economy is back to where it was prior to this. I mean, our economy was in amazingly good shape. Some hints of an economic recession may be on the horizon, but on 3.5% unemployment is amazing, right? It just where the stock market was, it was amazing. People are going to have to be diligent going forward. So there's no magic, right? There's no, there's no, you know, there's nothing that's going to say, ah, oh, the economy's back. So fine, then reserve yourself to the fact that it's going to take time and effort and diligence. Now, plan, 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 plan. Go through your family budget. Go through your company's budget. Try to make every dollar count, every cent count, right? And if you do those exercises, I mean, you'll find things. You'll say, there's an opportunity for me to, why well, don't I need to save that $9? Yeah, you might. I mean, save it. 
if you can't, don't have to spend it. So, I mean, I did this exercise with some students uh, with a program, uh, a bunch of postdocs at Emory yesterday, and then I'm working with another group at Emory, Exec Ed, as well. And I, and I did it, and I said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I, I'm, I'm still um, – I'm still registered to receive like streaming video from MLB.com. I got to go cancel that. Like there's no baseball season and there's not likely to be a baseball season. I want to watch. So, and I'm a baseball junkie. Okay. I'm going to cancel that. Oh my gosh. My Comcast has like, you know, I could watch the playoffs for NHL hockey. I can watch the playoffs for basketball. I don't need the access to those channels, you know? So I called up Comcast. I said, you know, cancel all those. And it's only going to save me like maybe, eight dollars or nine dollars or something but you say okay so i saved the nine dollars from that that are ten dollars from that so ten dollars for a whole year that's 120 dollars okay well so maybe i don't have to apply you know do those anymore so then over the next five years i mean that's like six or seven hundred bucks i mean that's enough to you know take the take the family out for a nice meal or two or three right i mean it's be diligent about how you're spending your money and, and really start tracking and then understand that there's no, not going to be any kind of a light switch that goes on. It's going to be a dimmer switch for sure. And it's going to start really dim and it's going to get light over a year or two. That If you prepare for that, then you're just setting yourself up for more success, I think. Fantastic, hey, Tom. Hey, Brandon, how much time do you have? I, I apologize. Some questions came through that I didn't see, but Isaac texted me. We've got three more. Do we have time to cover those? Well, um, Emily told me people don't want to stay on for a full hour, but if we've got those questions, I think we should take it on. Okay, so let's take it on. Let's okay. let's do it. If Tom it's, if Tom can handle, so I, I still want to get Tom done before one o'clock. So let's go. Oh ahead no, no, and, no, we're fine. Okay. We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. Okay, rapid fire. Um, from Kristen, what industries or trends do you feel are well positioned and that people will gravitate towards in this new normal? Ah, the industries that are, um, I think people are going to work on their homes. They're going to try to make their homes better. Uh, if companies are offering in programs to help them make their living space more livable, more enjoyable, I think that those companies are going to do pretty well. I mean, I'm spending a ton of time at the house and I'm thinking, geez, should I put in some other surround sound speakers or something? I mean, it's right. I mean, it seems like a luxury item at this point, but you know, if I'm, I got to be more comfortable here. Um, Brandon was talking about getting himself, you know, some lighting, you know, cameras and microphones and whatever else. I mean, everybody's working at home. The industries that are providing um, things that make it easier for you to work at home are really well positioned to be successful. Brandon, what do you think? I would say the same thing. Cable companies are going to be in good position. You know, if, you, if you've got uh, high speed fiber and other kinds of abilities to allow people to stream all their technologies and do video calls and everything else at, from home. I think that's a market that's going to be strong. Um, and generally speaking, you know, home delivery. So Amazon is mm, going to be mm -hmm. fine in all this, you know, mm -hmm. because I mean, more stuff kind of coming from home. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with Tom completely that it's going to be, you know, how do we make our, our home space more functional? Mm -hmm. um, for all aspects of our life. So it's going to serve more functions for us. Yes, it will. So even, even, even the companies that are in like a home gym equipment, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I would, I used to just go to the gym across the street. I, I still probably will do that eventually, but gym equipment is become, so how, how can our home function more, more parts of our life and anything that's in that space? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Whitney, how about the next one? All right, Maureen and Chichi both asked about open offices and open uh, shared workspaces like WeWork. Oh, Thoughts on that? Interesting. Those? <laughs> uh, WeWork was having such troubles even when the economy was was rambling, right? I think I read an article or two about the CEO of WeWork and some. I mean, it's just. Uh, great concepts, you know, it's great to have that, you know, cold brew coffee or, you know, like donuts in the afternoon, but I don't know if it's a real profitable industry. Those companies, it's nice to get out of the house clearly and work, right? I think people are being are realizing that they can get their job done in a room in their house in a closet. I mean, I, I had an NPR interview and the guy was literally in his closet. He's like, I'm in my closet. I said, wow, you're working in your closet. He's like, yes, yeah, sounds actually pretty good in here. People are finding ways to work at home. I fully anticipate when the economy gets back open up, people are wanting to get out, but they're not gonna wanna get out to work. They'll go, 
I can save that six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars. We can work from home. I fully anticipate that companies like that are going to crash. I would even actually go so far as to say that I anticipate a fair share of people who have offices like yourself, Whitney, when this thing gets back and going, people will say, you know, we're spending so much money on the actual physical office. We don't need it. Y'all were so productive. Maybe we do um, some kind of a big meeting, you know, at, at, at some kind of a conference space, like once a quarter, everybody gets together. Um, you know, we have smaller group meetings where we go out and have a lunch or, you know, just get a get a, some kind of a space at a, at a Emory Conference Center or a hotel like that or something like that. But then otherwise, you just work at home. We're going to save all that capital and spend it on research and development or ingenuity or a better marketing plan or something. A bunch of companies aren't going to open up their physical office space when this is all said and done. So I think those companies are, are going to crash and burn. But I don't know. What do you think, Brandon? I would agree with everything you said. I think I think the only thing that is valuable in the physical space is the ability to meet with people and have meetings in person. Yeah. And even in the open office environment uh, companies I work with, the premium is always the meeting spaces. Mm -hmm. That's where everyone that's booked all the time. Everyone wants to come together and have a meeting. So right. I think that's going to be the backbone of what why people would come to work is for the meeting space. And then there may be something central that's more of like the hoteling concept where it's just, you know, long tables, you just kind of hang out, you plug in, you work almost like a coffee shop style or a library style. Yeah. But I do, I agree with Tom. I think people are going to want to work from home. And frankly, the jury's been out on open office. I, I want to be really clear. It's not like everyone's like, oh, hallelujah, this is amazing. No, 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 no. It has not shown to make people more productive. A lot of people really hate it. Uh, it does not lend itself for private conversations. Uh, not introverts, not. not big fans. So no. it's, it's a novel <laughs> thing that people kind of created because they think it's what millennials wanted when they came out of college, but there's no real research behind it. So uh, that's consistently saying it's great. So I have a feeling just like Tom said, the, the, the footprint is going to shrink down to maybe a third or a quarter of what it is today. And then, you know, you can work from home and, and create an environment that kind of fits you and suits you best. And some people want to work at Starbucks. Fine. Go work at Starbucks. Yeah. If you're not dealing with sensitive your, stuff, go, yeah, go do coffee that. office, your coffee. You know, some people need the energy around them of people. I, I get that. But I think, I think there's going to be more freedom to create your own workspace. that fits you with the caveat that there might be times we need, need to actually meet in person. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, and it's, and here's what I think is nuts about it is that, is that I'm having every, you know, every meeting is online. Every meeting is on zoom or some other kind of like a meeting platform like this. And I fully anticipate that going forward, I'm not going to be able to say like, oh, I'm working from home today, guys. You know, yeah, you guys have your meeting. They'll be like, okay, well, here's the Zoom link. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so even when I'm thinking, a, you know, maybe a year from now. Yeah. So if I'm not on campus, they'll say like, yeah. okay, we're meeting on Tuesday. Here's the link. Like, you'll, no have to brush your, you'll, you'll have to brush your hair and get ready for that call. I have Tom. to get ready for put on a clean black <laughs> T-shirt. Yeah, that's it. Whitney, was there one more or, or did we get them all? Yeah, we do. We have one more and um, it, it, it kind of piggybacks off of what you just said, but it, it goes a little bit deeper. So I'm going to read what Stephanie said. Um, she said, I read an interesting thought recently that said what was what, sorry, what was once a necessity will now be a luxury. So for example, we once viewed gathering people in a single space as necessary, like team meetings but in the future, it will now be a luxury that is only performed when necessary. So thoughts on that. Yeah. Tom, do you want to start? I can't. So I, I agree. I think that I mean, we just said this. I mean, you know, in the past, I mean, it was there's a lot of there's 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 a lot of value of getting together with your colleagues and bouncing ideas off, hearing what their perspective is, but also. I mean, seeing how they're holding themselves, if they're agitated or if they're relaxed, if they're excited about something, um, if so, there's a lot into body language with respect to communicating. And, um, and so interacting with people and seeing their body language and, and hearing their tone of voice, um, I think there's lots that you can gain from that. And so, so – you know, there's a reason why I, I like to teach my students in person is that they can see my energy. I can see when people are confused. They'll be like, mm, really? I mean, you know, they get that kind of like, you know, Labrador retriever kind of head shake thing going on. OK, that signals me that I got to stop. I got to redo this project, what have you. All right, let's talk about this some more. There's 
and I, when I'm in a classroom, I'm scanning all that. Or when I'm meeting with people, I'm talking about economic concepts. If people start going, wait a minute, what's going on? Now I know they're not saying anything, but I know that I need to go into something further. There's clearly a benefit to meeting in person. Um, so people will say, okay, like if I really got to get the pulse of a situation, we got to meet in person. If it's just pure information sharing, Bob, how's, you know, How's the sales numbers? Okay, I, up 3%. Great. Kristen, right? How's your sale? Like up 8%. Okay, terrific. Boom, 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 boom. Great. Okay, team, we'll see you next week. That's not going to have to be in person. So people are going to then pick and choose which is the more important meeting versus the more just sort of informational meeting with respect to actually like putting yourself at a, you know, a, a hand's distance from somebody. So I'm a, I'll close by kind of riffing off that idea. So if we take that idea and say what we thought was a necessity becomes a luxury, yeah. it's like all these experiences we had in person, you could put on a spectrum. Some are, you know, high value kind of luxury kind of experiences. And then some are just, you know, day to day, we just think of kind of blocking and tackling necessities, whether that's meetings where it's, it's been a waste of time at, at some points. And now we think more mm -hmm. efficiently about meetings, but even going to restaurants, so like take the restaurant yeah. idea. What if we start to treat going to a restaurant as a luxury instead of yeah. a necessity? <laughs> yeah. Then all of a sudden the restaurants that are going to uh, be able to survive that are going to have to create truly memorable experiences right. for us to just show up. <laughs> yeah. It can't just be a table and oh. food because why would I do that? And, you know, <laughs> I could just order and pick it up or have it you know, delivered to my house. You know? So it would have to be a real memorable experience, which makes it more of a luxury. So yeah. maybe we lose that spectrum a little bit and it starts to, you know, we, we, we start to kind of move down a little bit more in this, you know, if we're going to meet, it's got to be, you know, a really important, powerful event, not just, <laughs> not just a, a meeting at one o'clock because I don't know, I'll just call a bunch of people and we'll all show up and do stuff. It's going to have a lot more planning and effort put into it. This is not, this is not nearly as, as, so some people might say, no, 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 I don't think that could happen. Think about this, Brandon, when, when you and I, because you and I are about the same age, if we went to, let's say, the theater, like to go see a play when we were younger, this was an event, like people dressed up, like you had to get on like your Sunday church clothes. I mean, that's, that's how it was described in my family, like get on your church clothes. We're going to the theater, like, wow, that's awesome, right? And so – and it was an event, right? And just, I mean, so even, even, I mean, even going to church was an event, right? It's like you got to get in your church clothes, to go to church. Now people are like, eh, I'm gonna wear flip flops and sandals. It's so much more casual. And it's so chill, which is great for some people. But I could totally imagine it, the pendulum swinging back, wow, and going back to that. Okay, when it's the theater, it's like now it's an event. Like everybody gets dressed to the nines. Like, whoa, we're going out. We're going to interact with people. We're going to be close to people sitting next to people like this. Like, amazing. Let's go do this. I could I could see it, the pendulum swinging back. That would be interesting. I would like that to. Would be really I, interesting. I would like to have to dress up to go to the theater again. I, I would, would like to have really, to dress up. To well, go I mean, that's that kind of almost goes back in time, right? That's how people used to walk around in the world in the 20s, 30s, 40s. You wore a suit. You wore a hat. You wore dress. I mean, you were dressed up. Yeah, I mean, think, I mean, it was think a it, signal to say, probably it was a signal to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm clean. worthy. <laughs> I'm, I'm clean and I'm worthy. I'm, I'm not right? contagious. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. You know? Yeah. I, whereas, whereas if you're wearing sweatpants and flip flops and you got like mustard stain on your shirt. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. It, signals exactly. like, uh, I'm not clean. Exactly. You might want to <laughs> keep 12 feet from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could, I could see it. I, see, I could see these what goods that we take as being commonplace all of a sudden become. Mm -hmm just a, a very, very not so commonplace. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Interest, uh, interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what the future brings, but I'm hopeful. Yeah. I'm going to go put on my suit. <clears throat> okay. Good idea. Me too. Do that. <laughs> hey Tom, thank you. That was fantastic today. I really appreciate you carving out some extra time for us today. And thank you for kind of uh, watching and listening. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, hopefully this was very valuable to you. I know this was really helpful for, for me to learn from Tom and, and get his perspective. And of course, you can check out some of our, our past shows, both on uh, theworkplacetherapist.com. And even if you're not subscribing to iTunes, of course, you do that too. That's how we kind of get grow our tribe. And so until our next show next week, have a really great week, really safe week, and an awesome life. So bye, everybody. Wave, wave bye to Tom. <laughs> <laughs>